Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's good to be with you another evening to share God's word with you. The last time I shared with you sometime in November, I shared on resolving conflicts among married couples or conflicts in marriage generally. I want to continue on the same vein but at this time, looking at conflict on a general basis, and then to zoom it particularly to looking at conflicts in churches, because churches are not exempt from conflict. If heaven wasn't exempt from conflicts, then churches, even though we uphold the name of Jesus, would not be exempt from conflict. I want you to join with me this evening. I want you to turn up your, your ears. I want you to take note of the study this evening. We continue this for the next two Tuesdays as we delve deeper into conflict resolution. May I invite you to join with me as we ask God to be with us this evening. Because indeed, we can't do anything without him. We need him. He's, it is in him that we live and move and have our being. Our existence is anchored upon him. Father, we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you, God, for your mercy and your grace. For your loving kindness. We thank you, God, for carrying us through today, Lord God. And we thank you for bringing us back home Lord God, we thank you that you have brought us to this junction in our lives that we can incline our ears and our hearts, Lord, to your word. May you be present with us this evening, God. May you speak to us, Lord God, individually. May you speak collectively. May your word, Lord God, find root and it find room in our hearts. May your word, Lord God, this evening mend broken homes May men, Lord God, broken relationships. May, Lord God, your word um, do a work, God, in our lives. So we commit this time, Lord, in your hands, and we thank you in your son's name. Amen and amen. So we want to look this evening on the theme, conflict resolution, and in particularly resolving conflicts in churches. This study I will do for the next two Tuesdays represent information and notes that I adapted from Myron Rush, the writer of the book Management, A Biblical Approach, and from June Hunt, who is a subscriber to Biblical Counseling, and she subscribed under the theme solving people problems so i pull information from both writers to speak to us this evening i want to read to us firstly from genesis chapter 11 and verse 6 and it says in the amplified version and the lord said behold they are one unified people and they all have the same language this is the is only the beginning of what they will do in rebellion against me and now no evil thing they imagine can can do will be impossible for them and paul writing to the galatian church writes in chapter 5 and verse 15 if you keep on biting and devouring each other watch out or you will be devoured by each other. Sooner or later, every manager or leader finds himself involved either directly or indirectly in some form of organizational conflict. And throughout the human history, the improper handling of conflicts has destroyed marriages and friendships, dissolved business partnerships, 
and cooperation caused the downfall of great leaders and political empires and sparked wars. And that's Russia's position. Russia also contends that conflict is a potentially dangerous phenomenon capable of destroying the effectiveness of any organization or leader. And I want to say that again, that conflict is a potentially dangerous phenomenon capable of destroying the effectiveness of any organization or leader. So as, as a leader, leader of organizations, leader of institutions of your own homes, then you have to be very careful and very mindful of the potential of conflicts. And when you, therefore, when you see conflict arises, then you must respond to it as quickly as you can and out that fire, put out that fire. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, <clears throat> Galatians 5 verse 15 says, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Conflict in human affairs is inevitable. And I want to say it again, conflict in human affairs is inevitable. I'm sh I can't find one person who has never faced conflicts. Even the baby on the breast face conflicts. Because sometimes the baby wants the, 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 the breast and the breast is not available. Some conflicts are always there. As long as human beings in groups and organizations seek to progress or institute change, there will always be change. Human beings are, of, are naturally resistant to change. And once change takes place, and change, as someone says, is always constant. There are always changes that will happen. This COVID-19 COVID has brought about so many changes, not only in the world generally, not only in organizations, but changes even in our own personal lives, changes in our own homes. Some of us who used to walk, come in from off the street and just step in, realize now that there's a pushback. You now have to leave the shoes at the door and, and, and walk, come in. Some of us have to take off our clothes and, and before you get in the house. So some person have to be accessing the, the house from a different route because they need to change their entire clothes before they get in. And I imagine those who work in the central service, like the nurses and the doctors, will understand exactly what I mean. So this means that conflict is important in the quest for progress. Unfortunately, however, conflict is mostly associated with strife and destruction of relationships. If we continue to be so as long as human beings lack the art, it will continue to be so as human being, beings lack the art of managing conflict. What is conflict? Conflict can be defined as open and hostile opposition occurring as a result of differing viewpoints. And conflict should not be confused with disagreement because it is possible to, to disagree without hostility. But conflict always involves hostility posited by, by, by rush. Conflict is actual or perceived opposition of needs, values, and interests. It is actual or it is perceived. And sometimes the perception of conflicts do more damage than the actual existence of conflicts. A conflict can be internal within oneself and we see that with Jesus in the Garden of, of Gethsemane, when he struggled with his human feeling, with the pain, what he saw before him, with the pain and the agony of the cross, and conflict with his missions and his purpose. And we thank God that while he struggled with his humanness, that he said to the Father, nevertheless, let this, nevertheless, let thy will be done. 
So we have conflict with oneself. In political terms, conflict can refer to wars, rev rev revolution, or other struggles which may involve the use of force as in the term armed conflict. Without proper social arrangement or resolution, conflicts in social settings can result in stress or tensions among stakeholders. When an interpersonal conflict does occur, it affects its effect is often broader than two individuals involved. And you see that in homes. When, when there's a conflict, and if that conflict many times get resolved by, by, by or ended up more so, because oftentimes it's not resolved, ended up in divorce, who gets affected? Not only the wife and the husband, but oftentimes the, the children are affected. Sometimes the in-laws and the extended family members are affected. So it oftentimes affect, the effect is broader than two individuals and can affect many associate individuals and relationships in more or less adverse and sometimes even way. And that is put forward by Wikipedia. Conflict occurs between two or more people who disagree on an issue that threaten their respective goals, values, or need. I'm laying up a foundation, so I want you to bear with me, and then we'll drill down to some nitty gritty and some fine tuning. But we must understand that conflict is a resolution rather than a broad topic. You search the, the World Wide Web and you'll find a litany of information. I'm just, I just managed to pull a few from the World Wide Web and pull a, pull a few from these two writers. So conflict occur between two or more people who disagree on an issue that threatens their respective goals, their respective values, or their respective needs. How the participants in an disagreement perceive this threat determines to a great extent how heated the conflict can become. How the, how the, how the threat is perceived determines how heated and to what extent the conflict can become. With only so many resources and opportunities available within any social setting, it is an uncommon, it is not uncommon for conflicts to arise. On the contrary, when handled effectively, conflict can lead to personal growth and create a change needed to improve interpersonal relations, relations overall. So it, it, if, if it is handled properly, and it can be handled properly, and should always, we should always seek to handle conflict properly. The ultimate root cause of conflict happens when you perceive something or someone as a threat to some area of your well-being. So if your well-being is threatened or perceived to be threatened, then it's going to trigger a conflict. Threats typically trigger emotional or psychological response. Naturally, psychologists will tell you, when this happens, your, when this happens, your ability to perceive, when this happens, your ability to perceive and approach the situation in an objective manner is ampered. This, in turn, makes it seem like there is a limited number of solutions to a particular problem. One's perceptive, one's perceptive is, um, is perspective rather is ampered by emotion. Communication becomes very difficult. And as I wind down to, to my introduction, conflict is an unavoidable aspect of everyday life. An unavoidable aspect of, of everyday life. Whether it is with others, yourself or an organization conflict is an inevitable aspect of life experience understanding how it starts how it escalates goes a long way towards knowing how to use it to your advantage and that's what genti wrote in 
in his book, What is Conflict Resolution? So we looked at conflict and we're going to look at what conflict resolution is. And so conflict resolution is a concept is conceptualized as the methods and processes involved in facilitating the peaceful ending of conflict and retribution. So it involves the process involved in facilitating the peaceful ending of conflict and retribution. Conflict resolution is a wide range of methods for alleviating or eliminating sources of conflict. The term conflict resolution is sometimes used interchangeably with the term dispute resolution or alternate or alternate resolution. Processes of conflict resolution generally include negotiation, mediation, and, and diplomacy. Let's look at the nature, the nature of conflict. And what will come out here, which you are seeing on your screen, is that Conflict is often seen in a negative manner or a destructive manner, but conflict can be productive and it can be positive. So despite the general perception that conflict is always of a destructive or a negative nature, conflict has a productive or a positive side to it. And we want to look at the the destructive side and the productive side of conflict. The, dis the destructive side, this flows from unhealthy people and relationship. Unhealthy people and relationship. It is often said that hurting people hurt others. Unhealthy people make other people's life unhealthy or in Jamaican terms can make your life a living hell. Where there is destructive conflict, you will often find a pattern of cruelty. Where there is destructive conflict, you will always find a pattern of cruelty. People will go deliberately to hurt you to hurt your family, to hurt your business, to hurt your, your, your properties, to hurt your asset. Always find a pattern of cruelty, a pattern of neglect, a pattern of deception, a pattern of control, a pattern of indifference, and even abuse in the relationship. But the productive side of the conflict, this is an open exchange of conflict or different ideas in which parties feel equally heard. And that is very important. It is open and the parties involved feel equally heard, equally respected, and feel unafraid. Unafraid to voice dissenting opinions for the purpose of reaching a mutually comfortable resolution. So the productive conflict, they set out from the beginning to reach a mutually productive and a comfortable resolution. So let's look at some aspect of destructive conflicts. And we will look at also at positive or constructive conflicts. So destructive conflicts, similar to ingesting poison, is a steady diet of destructive conflict. A steady diet of destructive conflict can kill you. So similar to ingesting poison, a steady diet of destructive conflict can kill you. It can kill you emotionally. 
It can kill you spiritually. It can kill you psychologically. And brothers and sisters, it can kill you physically. Destructive conflicts, re conflict reduces cooperation and teamwork. It reduces cooperation and teamwork. And you find that plays itself out ex particularly in corporations at the workplaces and even in churches. So destructive conflict reduces cooperation and teamwork and it causes hostility and it undermines systems and it undermines people. It undermines system and it undermines people. There are some typical behavior flowing out of destructive conflicts. And we want to look at them and then we will also look at some characteristics of destructive conflict. So some behavior that flow out of destructive conflicts are refusal to cooperate. So this is the reaction of persons who are caught in a destructive conflict. There is a refusal to cooperate, to cooperate with management, to cooperate with what I'm in the household, to cooperate with your spouse, with your children, children to cooperate with parents. So there's a refusal to cooperate. There is also verbal attacks, verbal attacks, and this verbal and these verbal attacks many times can be very belittling, it can be very demeaning, it can be very painful. And it can be very spiteful because sometimes these, ver and very humiliating because sometimes these verbal attacks, they happen in the public domain. I've seen it myself happening and I am oftentimes very embarrassed for the person who experienced the verbal attack. Right. So there's, it, there's a few words to cooperate there. There are verbal attacks and there is also sabotage. There is also sabotage, sabotage the system. And you see it happen so much in organization, in the workplace. And in particular, you see it up, up, operate, show its, its, its ugly head many times in, in, on, on the production floor, in manufacturing organizations where there is sabotage. A friend of mine used to work on an assembly line making cars and you have to generate about somewhere about 3,000 cars on a daily basis. Now if there is anybody on the assembly line that, is, that, has, dis, that has conflicts and set out to sabotage the work if they miss if they miss one iota of of the element of in respect to their side of the work it throws out everything so you might see a car coming down without any door because the person who's supposed to put the door on fell asleep or decided to sabotage so teamwork is extremely important in the manufacturing um, entities and where there are conflicts of a destructive nature it has to be nip in the bud and if not resolved then the person that on the assembly line you have to remove them otherwise it's going to affect the flow of the business another typical behavior that flows from destructive conflicts is talking behind each other's back just being bitchy and being very cynical and being critical also making deliberate errors deliberate errors within the organization deliberate errors but sometimes you know sometimes the, the, the error well they say deliberate errors but sometimes errors and that sounds like it is it is it is a knowing error but sometimes conflicts can affect you so much that it limits your thinking it limits how far you can go 
with your thought process. I remember in my early days in, in the audit profession that I worked with an organization and I only, only worked there for, for, for six months and I had to leave when I walked the job. I actually didn't resign the job. But I got to the point where my brain could not take me beyond, beyond a trial balance because I was so affected and there was so much conflict in the organization. And when I came to realize that my, the, my brain wasn't processing my, my work as I'm accustomed to, I recognized it was at a time to get the problem resolved and I saw no resolution immediately. I took my, my attache and I left. But destructive conflict shows itself in making deliberate errors and also shows itself up in purpose, purposely missing, missing deadlines. So let's look at some of the characteristics of destructive conflict. Once there is destructive conflict, then you are going to find secrecy. And secrecy plays itself out in, in, with persons withholding, withholding vital information that would render the organization um, progressing better, will render the organization meeting its deadlines, withholding pertinent information that sometimes affects the organization tremendously, pertinent information that even causes the organization to lose business, to lose clients, to lose customers. So, they do, so it, it plays itself out. So there is secrecy. And you, you realize how important resolving conflicts are. And organizations are very particular and careful to identify where there are conflicts and to make move, immediate moves to arrest conflicts because it is very threatening to the very existence of the organization. Worse if it involves someone at a very high level who, who, who is privy and exposed to the secrets of the company, it is very important that you resolve. If you can't resolve, then it's of utmost importance that you part company. So characteristic of destructive conflict shows itself in secrecy, shows itself in threats, shows itself in coercion, and shows itself in bluffs. It also shows itself in misperception and miscommunication. And it shows itself in unbridled competition in which one party tries to destroy, tries to injure, or try to control the other or the others, and in which one party gains only at the other's expense. Conflict is a dangerous phenomenon. Let's look at the positive side of conflict. Product, productive conflict, a positive conflict, is an own exchange of conflict, as I read earlier, or different ideas in which parties feel equally heard respected and unafraid to voice dissenting opinions for the purpose of reaching a mutually comfortable resolution. Because this type of conflict allows individuals to feel comfortable sharing conflicting opinions and ideas. It is a very creative and dynamic process that reveals new possibilities and insight. It reveals new possibilities and insight because persons are free and open to voice their opinion because they know that their voices will be heard. And I want you to listen to that, you know. And I hope persons who are watching this are managers that you can take it back to your organization. If your employees are your subordinates 
are not comfortable that they will be heard they are not going to speak and if they are not going to speak sometimes sometimes your your employees the man on the floor the man at the lowest position in your organization has a secret that can change your entire organization has the remedy the solution to your problems so you must listen to them allow them to speak one of the things I, 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 I one of the things I love to do and I like to use the term let's have a conversation I like to talk to people let's hear what is what are the grouses what are your concerns and I will sit and listen the desiderata says even the dung and dull and the ignorant him have him story you must listen to him so there are some positive conflicts of a positive nature can result in creativity and innovation can result in what creativity and innovation conflict of a productive nature can promote change by raising problems and encouraging better solutions and it is not restricted to management staff only it's not restricted to those at the senior level sometimes we must meet to those at the ground level those on the floor on the assembly line who, who know the business inside out contrary to what you might think and you'll get some solution from them conflicts of a productive nature can push those involved to strive for a solution and it can lead to individual and organizational growth your organization can grow through conflicts many organizations brothers and sisters have grown through conflicts there are churches that have grown through conflict there's a book i just finished reading named who moved my pulpit similar to the book who moved my cheese and it's really teaching you how do you manage changes and it and it was about a pastor who when he came the sunday morning he saw his pulpit moved literally moved they changed his pulpit and he and he uttered the statement who moved my pulpit and it created a lot of division in the church and people left the church and it's at the point where he has to know settle down and brought in someone who was who was trained in conflict management and brought all the stakeholders together were they able to bring resolution to that simple problem about moving the pulpit and changing the pulpit and and in the end result they saw the church grew exponentially from one simple conflict that the church guided by the professional approach it from a positive perspective the so conflict of a productive nature can lead to individual and organizational growth and it can make us more tolerant more tolerant of opposing views brothers and sisters the world will not always agree with you everybody will not always agree with you your wife or your husband will not always agree with you your children will not necessarily see eye to eye with you but sometimes we have to agree to disagree amen sometimes we have to agree to disagree june hunt posits that there are some different types of conflicts and she put them in two categories intra and inter and she looked at intra conflict and inter conflict in respect to the to the individual and also in respect to the organization and when you talk about the intra it is what happens within oneself so we have here now the interest a struggle within oneself to decide between two 
or more choices. It is a struggle within oneself to decide between two or more choices. And I hope none of you are struggling to decide which, which lady to marry or which gentleman to marry. But you can have inter, intra struggle to decide which church to attend. You can have inter, intra struggle as to decide which service to attend. Amen. And the biblical example here is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, as to which which side of which side he responds to. Does he should he respond to the pain, the natural pain, the physical pain, the mental agony? The, the emotional agony. The Bible said that his, his, his sweat became like his blood. His sweat became like drops of blood. And it speaks to the, the intensity of the, of the trauma that Jesus faced in the Garden of Gethsemane. Does he, does he yield to that? Or does he give, 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 give in to the purpose of which he came to earth? So there was a struggle between his flesh and his spirit between how he felt and his mission. And you find that in Luke 22, verses 42 to 44. But there's also inter, inter, which speaks to a clash of idea, ideas or interests between two or more people. So this is external. It's not just within you, but it involves you and someone else. It involves one organization or another organization. It's a clash of idea or interest between two or more people. And, and the example here is between Jacob and Esau. When Jacob robbed Esau of his birthright, and he, as guided by his mother, I think it was Rebecca, and then she sent him off to his uncle Laban to, to cool off where he found wife and all of that. But, and on his way back, as long as he was away, it never solved the problem in running away. The problem was always there. On his way back after many years, he saw Jacob, he saw rather, he saw lay waited him. And he was afraid that Esau was going to Doing, doing, doing harm. So he sent his wife along with the servants and he faced him by himself. So the inter is a class of interest between two or more people. And we have that from time to time. That's one of the common ones we have, right? Where we have clash between ourselves and other people. And that one has its challenges and its difficulties. But also the inter-conflict has its own challenges too. And sometimes it's harder to resolve that problem than the, one, than the inter-conflict. But there's also intra and inter-conflict in terms of organizations. In terms of organization, the intra, it speaks to a competitive or opposing action within a group within a group and the group could be a family it could be a department it could be within the music department god forbid it could be within the worship department it could be within the within the what the world department or it could be in our administrative office or it could be at the board level god forbid but that is intra-organizational conflict and we have an example here where the conflict rep reports following the scouting of Canaan. When, when, when they were sent to, to scout out Canaan, Joshua sent the spies to scout out Canaan. And they came back with conflicting reports. And that... And that had it. No, it's not Joshua. It's when Moses sent them, actually. When Moses sent them and they came back with conflicting report. 
And that one, that conflict caused the children of Israel to journey for 40 years. A journey that they could have done in 40 days because there was organizational conflict. The report they brought back was conflicting. The one came back with fear. Well, the majority came back with fear. It was only Joshua and Caleb who came back with a positive attitude. Yeah, yeah, there were giants in the land, but we can conquer them because of the God whom we serve. But it didn't cut with the majority. And they opposed Moses and he caused them to journey for 40 years. And a great majority of them, only a few that was present then entered the promised land. God carried them in circles in the wilderness for 40 years until they died. But there's also inter-organizational conflict. And it's, it speaks of a battle or a, a battle or opposing action between two or more groups, between families, between companies, between religions, even between countries. And we and we and, and we have the example of the conflict between the, the Israelites and the children and the Egyptians. In Exodus chapter 14. And I want to touch the characteristics of handling conflicts. We're not complete all of them this evening, but I want to look at the characteristic ways of handling conflicts. And then next week we will look mainly at how we resolve conflicts or we deal with conflicts, or we approach conflicts. So these are some characteristic ways of handling conflicts. Each one of us begins to develop a style of handling conflicts at an early age. And your personal way of fighting evolves out of your natural instinct. It evolves out of your personality and it evolved out of your early family dynamics. And many of us are unable to diffuse conflicts because we are repeating the extreme patterns of childhood, attacking and confrontational. And that's, these, are, that, these are the two extremes. Attacking and confrontational, or evading, evasive and avoiding. Either strategy fails to appropriate the grace that is available to a child of God in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. And let's just look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. And it reads thus, see to it that no one fall short of God's grace, that no root of resentment springs up and causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. And let's read verse 16, and see to it that no one is immoral or godless, like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. And we stop there. So let's look at ways of handling conflicts. There are two main headings, main approach, approaches. One, you have the attackers and you have the avoiders. You have the attackers and you have the avoiders. And this is how June Hunt labeled them. And under the attackers, you'll find she used some animals. And the first one is the shark, otherwise known as the dictator. And the shark is controlling. This is how they end the conflict, the attackers. The shark as the attacker or the dictator is controlling, judgmental, 
close-minded, critical, and uses power, uses power play. Very controlling, very judgmental, close-minded, which means they're not, they're not listening to you. Critical, and they use a lot of power play. What is the message they want to send to you? Give in to me or I will attack. And if you think about it, you must have come across people like those. I have come across many of those in my lifetime. Give in to me or I will attack. And the goal, what is the goal of the shark? The goal is to win and always maintain control. The goal is always to win and maintain control. Those who watch is NBC or NBC who watch Shark Tank, you'll realize it's exactly what happened. Give in to me or I will attack. And their goal is always to win and always maintain control. But there's another attacker which I refer to as the snake aka as the backbiter. The backbiter bites when you are not looking. But not only bites, but the backbiter will stab when you're not looking. The backbiter uses criticism and put downs. So every opportunity the backbiter or the snake gets will put down their victim because there is no intent to bring resolution to the conflict. The snake starts false rumors. And we have to be very careful of that, you know. They start false rumors. And before you realize, they send is a wildfire of false rumors about the person. And many times, you really find one of the recipients of the rumors set out to bring the two parties together to, to, to verify or to validate the rumors. But oftentimes, the rumor goes out and we are, we can be very gullible and then we perpetuate the same rumor and worsen the situation. That is the work of the, the snake. Start false rumors. The snake also pretends to have done nothing wrong. So they send out the rumors, the false rumors, and pretend to be the nice guy to do absolutely nothing wrong. And at the same time, they are gathering allies. They have done nothing wrong. They send the rumor out. They are the good guys, and they are gathering allies. What is the message? Don't tangle with me, or you will regret it later. Don't tangle with me. That's a snake. That's a backbiter, or you will regret it later. The goal is to make myself look good in the eyes of others by tearing someone else down. If we continue to bite at each other, Paul writes to the Galatians, if we continue to bite at each other, brothers and sisters, Paul says, watch out. Watch out, or we will destroy each other. And I want to stop right there. I want to stop right there, and I will pick up next week where we look at the last attacker, and then we will look at the avoiders, and then we will delve into the whole thing of how we resolve conflict. So the idea is how to resolve conflict as the main objective, but I'm laying the foundation and telling you what to expect and what is out there and then how we resolve these conflict. God bless you. Let me pray before we go. Father, we thank you we thank you, God, that even though conflict is an unavoidable phenomenon, 
As long as we are on this earth, we will always face conflicts. We are thankful, God, that conflicts are not always negative. Conflicts are not always destructive. But Lord, they are positive and productive conflicts. And Father, may you cause us as believers, as children of thine, may you cause us, Lord, who carry the very presence of God with us. May you cause us, Lord God, to be peacemakers as you declare in the beatitude that the peacemaker is blessed and the peacemakers are referred to as the children of God. May we recognize God and understand that if we are children of God, that we must at all times seek peace, seek to maintain peace, seek, seek to establish peace. Father, I pray that you will enter into homes this evening, that Lord God, you will give us drives and give us determination, Lord, to deal with the conflicts that exist, Lord, in our relationships be it at home, be it, Lord God, at the workplace, be it at church, Lord, be it between our, our, our siblings, be it between, be, all be it between, Lord, our spouses and our children. Lord, I pray you'll grant us the grace and grant us the strength. And Lord, grant us the, the enablement and the anointing to bring resolution to the conflicts that we face. So Father, we give you thanks and we bless you and we thank you in your son's name. Amen and amen. God bless you.